Hello everyone, thank you for checking out the making of Dagoras. My name is John Salim and I'll walk you through my process of developing creatures from sculpting, modeling, texturing and look dev all the way to comp. I'll be mimicking the same approach I take in VFX pipeline and I will briefly highlight the main steps in each process to achieve the final look of the creature. Let's dive in. So here we are in Maya. I'm creating a scale mesh to be used as reference in ZBrush. I wanted to start sculpting the concept with the correct final scale. It affects our subsurface in look dev, displacement, and other aspects of character development. I decided to make him 155cm in height and explore different creature designs in ZBrush. After importing the scale mesh in ZBrush, I usually start from primitives to quickly block the main shapes and proportions, typically starting from the ribcage and the pelvis. And I knew from the start I won't see his body in the final render, but still I wanted to have a good base mesh to layer the costume on top of. At this stage, I don't worry about technical details or which tool to use in ZBrush. I just go with the flow and try my best to nail the concept. Also, the concept will continue to evolve and get updated, so I don't get attached to any ideas at this stage. I usually start sculpting in symmetry first, then break the symmetry halfway, and that is usually when I'm happy with the initial proportions and the concept. For the costume, I either mask and extract from the body mesh or quickly model a low-res mesh in Maya, and then sculpt it in ZBrush, which in this case, I prefer to concept sculpt in ZBrush it is cost effective to create multiple versions of the costume and not be concerned about remodeling while exploring ideas. For my personal projects, I like to create topology for the current character to match the anatomy and proportions of the current design. Occasionally, I use Wrap 3D to transfer topology from previous projects, and that's only if the current sculpt is close or similar to the previous topology. I prefer blocking out the main features first and then connect the topology shells as I go. This approach, in my opinion, is faster and allows you to control the polyflow much easier. For me, it does help solve the topology puzzle much quicker. There will be back and forth between Maya and ZBrush at this stage to ensure everything fits well around the body. The costume pretty much done the same way, which is decimating and retopologizing in Maya and of course projecting the high-res details in ZBrush and do the cleanup. To save you hours and hours of this repetitive process, I'll jump to the end where the topology of the body and the costume are done and ready for the model turntable. Here is the final model with the high-res details projected on the clean base mesh. It also has more sculpting details since we have clean topology with UVs. I ended up exporting level 2 as base mesh in Maya and Mari. For the displacement, I'm using 4K resolution. I'm setting the subdiv level to 2 since I'm exporting level 2 to Maya and Mari. I'm using EXR, 32-bit floating point, 3 channels, and Mari UDIM for UV tile format. Back in Maya, I prefer to keep the body UVs in the first two rows and shift the costume UVs and other elements up in V. Even though the body geo is asymmetrical, especially in the head, I always keep UVs symmetrical by mirroring half of the body to the other side. You'll be able to link, transfer, or copy-paste UDIMs in Mari, which is a huge time saver in texturing. I also keep different materials in separate UDIMs, such as the skin, leather, metal, etc which is very important when creating texture maps and shaders in LookDev. Under the main asset group, I typically create two groups, one for the body, another one for the costume. These include subgroups as well to maintain a clean and organized structure. I also include the material type in the geometry name, for example, skin, leather, metal, rock, etc., which is very useful when assigning shaders in LookDev. And finally, I export an Alembic file as well for LookDev. I knew the costume design would be a lot of work, so I started with the costume first. I wanted to nail the shapes, scale, and layout before diving into other maps. So the pattern channel was the first channel to attack, since it would be shared with most of the channels. 
For the patterns channel, I started with the fabric pattern first. Some patterns are tiled maps I acquired online, and some I created in Photoshop. I use tiled nodes in my workflow most of the time, while playing with the U and V values to find the scale I'm after. I then keep applying different tiled nodes with different patterns for each element. I create a group for each tiled node and apply a mask for the group to isolate the piece on the model. You'll see I take the same group mask approach for the color map and other channels. And for the color channel, I created a group and a mask for each material. Then I masked out the unnecessary parts. For example, a group for the cape, the pants, leather, etc. This allows any projection or procedural node I use inside the group to affect only that isolated mesh. I then moved on to the AO and curvature nodes, layering them on top of the initial colors. Following that, I utilized the patterns channel to enhance the colors. For painting the skin, I decided to use a node-based system in Mari. To break down the template from left to right, the left section is where I import the maps from ZBrush or any 3D package. The middle section is what I call the dev area or node structure. And the right section feeds into the channels which output into materials and shaders. I started with color nodes for primary color and then added the AO and cavity maps with a mask to control the intensity. I also used the red channel from ZBrush displacement, then added more color variations around the eye socket, eye bags, cheeks, ears, and lips, controlled by masks to control the intensity. I also used procedural cloud nodes with different sizes, intensities, and roughness, masked by custom brushes with custom alphas to create skin spots and liver spots. And finally, I use a few HSV nodes to adjust the brightness and saturation in some areas on the model. One of my favorite features in Mari is the broadcast node. It allows you to organize the entire node graph. For example, you can import your texture maps and broadcast them, and then receive them at any stage within the node graph in Mari. The spec color and roughness maps were done by receiving certain sections from the color map and then adding color nodes and masks to control the oily and rough zones on the skin. For the gold patterns, I only painted the black and white mask ID in Mari. I wanted the gold patterns to be entirely shader controlled in LookDev. Here we are in Katana, and the fun part begins. This is an asset template I created while working on different projects. If you are working on your own project at home or picking up Katana for the first time, you probably won't need all of the nodes in this template. I recommend the following nodes at least to start loop debbing your asset. An importmatic node to import your asset, a gaffer node to create light rig, NMC and material assign nodes to create and assign materials, a camera in render settings created in Katana or imported from any 3D package, a PRMan global statement and integrator nodes, since in this case I'm using RenderMan as my renderer, and render node for output. I started from these nodes first, then I built up my template over time to utilize more features in Katana. I created multiple NMC nodes and then merged them into one group for better organization. I like to separate the costume from the skin, the scepter, and of course the environment, each into their own NMC node. I created a material assign node for each material, assigned to the corresponding object or multiple objects. Then I created a group stack containing the first material assigned and duplicated the node inside the stack whenever I wanted to assign a new material. This way we will keep our material assigned nodes organized in one group stack which avoid cluttering the node graph. I like to keep the node graph organized and readable as much as I can. 
Therefore, I like to use the group stack and merge nodes whenever I can. I like to use wildcards in the cell statement in the material assign node. By leveraging the material name in the object suffix, it will be very easy to assign the material to one or multiple objects at the same time. This technique is not only good for characters, but also if you are dealing with large environment with multiple objects in the scene. Typically, I start by assigning the displacement from ZBrush first, then render a model turntable in neutral studio environment before adding other maps. Not only it helps me judge if the displacement is good enough for final render, but also serves as starting point to compare to when adding other texture maps. I'm using Pixar's render man for this project. I utilized the layered shader approach for the skin and the costume. I have all the main maps connected to a layer shader for the skin as a base. Then I created another layer shader for the gold patterns on his face. Both shaders are connected to a layer mixer and the end result of the layer mixer feeds into a Pixar layered surface, which serves as the master shader. And the gold ID I painted in Mari is connected to the mask of the first layer to show the gold shader only in the masked patterns. It looks complicated, but it will be very easy when you do it a few times. And also, it's very common to use layered shader approach on complicated assets in production. I also use the same gold ID to remove the gold patterns from the subsurface. For the costume, I created a material for each of the fabric, leather, metal, and the stone on his chest. I used a layered shader to control the golden edge on the cape with edge ID painted in Mari. And with the daisy chain technique, I added color correct nodes and remap nodes to modify the spec and rough maps. The color nodes and remap nodes has either mask IDs or prim bars plugged into the mask input. For look dev lighting, I use neutral studio light rig most of the time especially at the beginning. Every now and then, I kick off a render using an overcast or sunny light rigs, just to check my shader values. I also render in final shot light rig every time I hit a milestone, since it is the final rig for the final render. To break down the shot light rig, I have a key light shooting from the top on his face. I have a fill light shooting from the right side direction to kill the harsh shadows. I have two rim lights shooting from the back, blue rim light shooting from the left, and yellowish light shooting from the back left. I have eyes light, which only emits reflection and specular, it doesn't have any diffuse contribution. I have a yellow bounce light from the scepter, emitting light on his shoulder, middle pieces, the neck, and this side of the face. And finally, I have a light inside the glass bowl emitting light on the glass cage. In addition to the light switcher macro, which I created working on previous project, I created another macro to choose the camera and render resolution. The Foundry website has excellent step-by-step -step tutorials on how to build macros in Katana. And finally, I kick off one more final render with all the render passes and AOVs required for comp. Finally, we are in comp stage now. Here is my Nook script, it's pretty straightforward. I started by reading all my render passes and rebuilt the beauty pass. And then, leveraging the AOV passes I rendered in Katana. And here is where AOV shines. They are very powerful in enhancing the image without the need to re-render again. For example, I'm using the curvature pass to enhance a few parts of the character, then using it as a mask in a grid node to enhance the curvature pass. And that's what this backdrop right here encompasses, pretty much utilizing AOVs to enhance a few things on the character. Next, I added a grid node to update the exposure and light balance. Then I used the same AOV passes to color correct a few areas on the costume and the skin as well. For the background, I want it to be simple while keeping the focus on the character. 
So I went with building cloud-like noise in the background with subtle animation, which is simply a few noise nodes with animation in Z and scale values. I rendered a separate AOV for the orb on the scepter. So I used it to color correct the emissive pass and also enhance the glow effect on the orb. And I also tracked the same pass to add lens flare effect on the scepter. And then for the final image, I ended up adding a few nodes as a final touch, such as chromatic aberration, grade, foam grain, etc. Then finally, I rendered animation sequence. It took a couple of days for the 3D render to finish. I had to compromise about a few render settings and render resolution for 100 frames. In the end, it totally worth it. Thank you very much for checking out the making of the Goras. It was a fun project for me to work on. I hope you enjoyed the breakdown. I know there's a lot to unpack and cover in a very short time, but I hope you had fun. Once again, thank you and see you in the next one.